Hello and welcome to Starting Conversations. I'm Bethany Tabor, the host of this series, which is brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. Today, we return to our series, Asequia Aki, which is co-presented with the Paseo Project in Taos. The Paseo Project's mission is to transform art through community and community through art. In addition to collaborative community projects and a socially engaged artist in residence program, the Paseo Project hosts the annual Paseo Outdoor Art Festival in historic downtown Taos. Since 2014, artists from all over the world have brought projection, installation, and performance art to the streets of Taos for this free two-night event. More can be found at paseoproject.org. The Asequia Aki Starting Conversations series is celebrating Paseo Project's recent publication of the same name. This booklet highlights selections from the Asequia Aki project that took place between 2018 and 2020. It's an artistic and community-driven project that aims to give voice to the historic Asequias of Taos to illuminate the importance of this vital resource and cultural wellspring. You can view and download a digital version of this booklet at paseoproject.org. For today's conversation, we are discussing the themes of technology and craft. Our guests, Morgan Barnard and Juanita Lavadi, are joining us to talk about their individual work in Asequia Aki and how their work addresses Asequia culture and engagement through new media technology and craft traditions. I'll start by introducing Morgan, who is a digital artist and designer working in the areas of public art, interactive media, immersive installations, and live cinema. His studio, located in the high desert of New Mexico, is focused on creating work that combines interactivity, data visualization, real-time systems, and experimental digital techniques to create unique experiences for audiences. So Morgan, uh, to start off, for Paseo 2019, you worked with uh, the youth media collective, True Kids One, to create projection mapped installations um, for it to tell the stories of the Asequias of Taos. Uh, can you go into a little bit how a little bit about how that collaboration came to be with True Kids One, and what was it like to see the story of the Asequias told through the eyes of the students that you worked with? Thanks so much. Um, yeah, it was an interesting uh, way that the project came about. Um, it was through uh, a, a group called the Stagecoach Foundation, which is involved in uh, trying to promote film education uh, within the. Uh, northern New Mexico area, all, all across New Mexico, actually. And they had done some work with True Kids One. Um, and so when the Paseo came up, um, True Kids One wanted to be uh, involved. And so um, through the Stagecoach Foundation, I got connected with True Kids One. And my background in art um, also includes a lot of education. So I've done a lot of work with uh, community college students. I'm currently a faculty member at Highlands uh, University. And so it was really kind of a natural connection um, to, to work with uh, high school students through True Kids One. And you know, the, uh, having the Asequia as a starting point, I thought was just a great place to explore how we share ideas, how we research and, and look into you know, what the kind of tangential ideas um, coming from the idea of an Asequia from students in the Taos area. And, you know, some of them have them coming, going through their properties and whatnot. So there was different levels of, of understanding um, of the Asequias. And so it, it was a really great opportunity to engage the, uh, the students and get them thinking about these systems and, and what they mean. So that's sort of how it all, Came together, and then we, you know, we we went around and walked the plaza area to, you know, just explore and look around and see what kind of opportunities were there for doing some kind of projection map installation. And I, I'm often, you know, interested in uh, areas that are, you know, kind of gl glossed over. You don't really notice them. You would walk by them and just think that they're part of the infrastructure or Part of part of the building, and so we we looked around at different places that we could sort of activate spaces that that were normally, um, you know, not valued. And so I think in, in some ways, you know, the the uh, Asequia system is invisible to a lot of people. So it's really about kind of finding these things and and turning a light on them and and um, reintroducing them in a way. 
and in the case of projection mapping, it's it's quite literally illuminating <laughs> illuminating the space that is um, that is overlooked, which is also why it was um, why it was great to looking at the at some of the documentation of that of your work. Um, projection mapping is happening only um, only able only visible at night in the darkness, and um, and it illuminates these these spaces. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the um, more specifically about the significance of each of your locations, um, or just a couple of the of a couple of them. So, the final location we we chose um, was um, just an interesting little area um, around, uh, kind of behind behind the plaza, and there was this sort of uh, electrical panels, you know, and and we were sort of interested in you know, looking at them as sort of screens for um, projection mapping different stories. And so that's really how everything sort of came together. And this, the sites, it turned out when we, when we finally produced it that the, the sites were where the students were going to collect content that was then brought back into the projection at that main site. So the students sort of funneled their, their content gathering back to that main site. And mm -hmm. so the multiple sites were, you know, um, where they were collecting footage. So they were they were wandering all around the plaza, you know, seeing what else was going on in the paseo and bringing that back into uh, the the main projection. So uh, so I, I think we, you know, it was the the idea of multiple sites really focused on that final site, but it was where they were bringing content back to. Almost like a functioning like a network, um, right. yeah. and uh, they were. Was there sort of direction to be? How did they craft these stories, or was was it all based on um, the history of the Asekias, uh, or was it sort of like on the future? What what kind of um, what kind of stories did the students end end up telling? Well, one of the things they did is they went around and, and asked people about their their own personal ideas or understandings of Asekias. Mm -hmm. So the stories were sort of built over over the evening through um, both interviews with people on the street, sort of, you know, man on the street kind of interviews. And then uh, also we asked people to participate by drawing as well. Mm -hmm. So we had a little station where um, people at the Paseo could come up and draw. And so we asked them, you know, to draw their understanding of water or their understanding of networks. And then those images were reprojected back into um, the projection. So it was sort of a visual story as well, as well as um, this kind of audiovisual narrative. And we had some uh, footage that that the students were using to to bring in. And this included um, some clips from from documentaries and some archival media like uh, photographs and, and things along those lines. That, um, that intersects really well with Juanita's work um, in terms of story sharing. And uh, I'll address Juanita now. Um, and just to introduce you, Juanita Lavadi is an educator, artist, a sequiera and historian. A retired public school teacher, oral historian, and graphic and fiber artist, Lavadi's creative and cultural interests are all keyed to the acequia system that supports the land, water, and inhabitants of northern New Mexico in general, and the traditional Hispano and indigenous cultures in particular. And so throughout this series um, in acequia a key, uh, we've been hearing from different artists who have participated in the festival saying that and a sequia can only do so much for the for its surrounding community so long as that community is actively engaging with it, maintaining the ditch, um, and also participating in in a number of certain rituals and traditions, um, community traditions. And so, with your piece in the festival, Juanita, um, you, weaving stories, you had people gather around and uh, participate in creating a collective fiber textile work. Um, and gathering together to share stories. Can you, um, can you discuss the parallels between gathering together to weave and make textile art and, also, and the culture of a sequia use? <clears throat> okay, well, it, it was a collaborative event. And to start with, I had four assistants. 
And um, also it was kind of um, tied in with the installation by Olivia Romo, who's been very active with the acequias. And her focus was actually pre Paseo, uh, the, the evening of the Paseo project, because um, they had um, tours with um, different sheep farmers. Hmm. And so using that concept of, of, okay, the sheep have to do with the agrarian and they need water too. You know, the the uh, sequia feeds a lot of different uh, forms of the agrarian culture. <clears throat> uh, we thought it would be kind of fun to do something where people can actually be active. So it's very hands-on. And uh, so the, the concept was we need a collaboration much like you know, the acequia is a collaboration of uh, people working together, making decisions, sharing water and sharing the labor. We just finished two weeks ago, the cleaning of the acequias. That's a major project. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the communication of sharing. So um, we decided to do something a little bit different and have something traditional where people could be engaged in a very active way to produce a final product. So I had, um, with the, the, the funding through the Paseo project, I was able to have five rope spinners based on a traditional uh, rope spinner from um, Puerto de Luna, which is kind of close to um, Santa Clara, I mean, Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very simple spinning tool that could be used by anyone. It's not like a spindle, which is a little bit more, it takes a little bit more to work with that or a spinning wheel. And um, the idea was also the concept of using what you have. So we decided, let's do something a little bit different. Let's just have, um, uh, let's recycle. Let's recycle uh, fabric from wherever the sources are. And uh, to just kind of bring in a little bit of high tech, because this is really low tech. <laughs> this is, um, we thought it'd be kind of fun to, to make a selection of fabrics that might have some kind of reaction to black light. So that was how we selected our, our fabrics. And those fabrics came from shirts, from sheets, from skirts. Uh, I think there was a bathrobe in there, shower curtains, um, um, you know, just different sources. And uh, so um, I, before the actual um, event on the park, um, we had, I had a workshop because I know some of the people who were helping me had been, had experience with weaving, but not necessarily with spinning. Mm -hmm. um, some of them had. Uh, the, the storyteller that, that uh, participated in this particular project um, has been very active with weaving and spinning, but she had never made rope. She never used the rope uh, spinner. So uh, we kind of worked with it so that once the evening came, everyone was able to have their own spinner and then bring people to engage in. So um, in order to bring people to make the connection, uh, we had a storyteller who um, had stories to tell about growing up with the acequias. And uh, so that was, that was ongoing during the, during the actual spinning. But in reality, once we got started with the spinners, uh, stripping the cloth was, was part of the activity, and that's kind of spinning back and forth where you can get a piece of cloth, but when you start going back and forth, you get a, a nice yardage. So some of those were actually about 80 yards long. Wow. And um, so we'd get, you know, someone to be on either end of this strip of cloth. And uh, with a spinner, just, you know, just keep spinning, which uh, that kind of length, you know, it, it can get very um, physical. Yeah, you have yeah. to be centered to spin. And so people would kind of cooperate. And gosh, I think we must have had easily about eight, 800 yards of rope that were finally made. Um, and it was wonderful to see. It was such a simple project because you're actually spinning. You're, you know, the, the spinner has a handle. And then there's a pivot where it, there's an extension that comes out and kind of demonstrating when, when you're spinning. The, the hook here gets a cloth, so you're just basically twisting the cloth. And it was so wonderful to see um, different community people work, work um, get involved and cooperate in spinning. But what I really appreciated as a school teacher, um, you don't often get 
fathers, you know, the, the parents, usually you get a lot of mothers in there, but it was really neat to see the fathers, you know, with their, with their children really working together towards spinning. So uh, we'd work at the spinning, we'd ply it, and we'd get these ropes. And the ropes are about an inch in diameter. They were kind of thick rope. And then um, then we started the weaving. And I do have, I do have a photograph of, of I think um, Paseo Project also included that photograph in the pamphlet hmm. where um, everyone is holding ropes to hold attention. And we're starting to weave uh, a circle around. And that particular weaving is on display at the uh, hub office of the Paseo mm -hmm. Project. It's, it's in there. And um, it was hundreds of hands. If you go in there and look at the weaving, it's hundreds of hands that went into this. But what I also appreciated about this, this project is that, that it's a very basic tool it's a very basic skill. It's almost, you know, everyone cooperating, just like it's very basic to work with a shovel. Mm -hmm. So it's a very basic tool that has its history in, in, in the, the culture here. And um, with the stories and the involvement, um, gosh, you know, I didn't have much chance to see a lot. I, I did steal time away to kind of run through all of the different projects that were going, but we had so many people that um, getting away was kind of hard. So I, I have to admit that uh, in my fast run, I, I saw things, but I didn't have the chance to really engage with the different events that were going on. So um, it was, I think it was very successful because it was so there were so many people that got involved and the intergenerational involvement was also spectacular. And we came out with a weaving that represented the cooperation of um, all the people involved. D did that answer the question? <laughs> yes, it did, yeah. And I, because I'd also wanted to talk about this um, sort of the, what lessons can textile and fiber arts um, teach us about, about gathering together as a community to, um, to create a network of, uh, a network and a system that is intricate and complex and vital to survival um, and that and that demonstrates that perfectly I mean thinking about um, as you say hundreds of hands coming together cooperating with one another mm -hmm. and uh, and working in tandem with one another and sort of getting into a rhythm as a community as a collective I think is really special um, to think about to think about the how, how a system like the Asequias work in, uh, in general. Um, can you talk a little bit more? You said that you chose fabrics that respond to black light or glow under black light. And so was it, um, did you have black lights sh shining on the fabric eventually? Yes, we did. Although, um, <laughs> that's what, uh, I'm just trying to remember that. It, we were so busy. We, we, we just had so many people standing in line to, waiting to take their turn to do it. Uh, we tried to get the lights in, but there were so many people that I, I don't know that the lights really, you know, if the lights really had their impact on the fabric. Sure. It, was, it was so much movement going on. But um, it is, what I like about it is, is that, um, you know, a shovel is a really, really, really old tool. Mm -hmm. But so is, so is a spinner. You know, it's, it's a really old, old tool for learning how to spin. You, you know, the fibers were spun into cloth and that's how people made their clothing. But it, um, it was just um, a positive reinforcement that people could take a very simple, basic tool and work together to collaborate, to come out with a finished project. Although, to be honest, they didn't really see it because it was in process so the sure. final evening is where we finally we had the final product made and i think a lot of people didn't see that but the satisfaction of having made rope you know from from rags and and, and they were beautiful they were really beautiful pieces that uh, we just had so much rope that we didn't we didn't use but a fraction of the rope that was actually <laughs> made so people actually got to take the rope with them oh, wow. i thought it was just it was just a good lesson of cooperation but also um, it's a very basic survival skill, mm -hmm. making, making uh, yarn, making rope. Yeah. I like this, uh, this parallel between the black light. And even though there was so, there were so many people that might not have 
glowed as much, but um, I like the idea of, again, this, the idea of illumination and, um, and acequias are, um, so, can sometimes be so hidden and like this, this network and the system or the overall uh, system, how it, how the main ditch and then the sort of offshoot ditches um, have to work together and it, it can go, you can walk past a very, very small acequia without noticing it. Um, or sometimes in the case of Taos, I know that some acequias have been paved over. And so you don't necessarily see the history um, of, that, of that system. And so I like this idea of both of your work using illumination as this tool to, um, to literally shed light on something that, can, that is so essential and vital that goes unnoticed sometimes with people. And I actually, this was a, a question that I wanted to ask both of you um, to hear your thoughts on about this sort of the relationship between um, new media technology, new technology in general, and older older tools, older technology. I mean, sh shovels are shovels and spinners are also technology in their own right. And um, and so I just wanna want to hear from you about what do you think how do you think that relationship between the old and the new comes into play with how we engage Asekias today? I could I could re respond a little bit. I mean, so something that came up just in in um, uh, about the, the 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 weaving work and the and the rope um, that was so interesting to me is, you know, and, and it's something I, something that I think um, some of the live new media work. Um, has issues with is like, what is the artifact? You know, like it's sort of ephemeral and it happens maybe while you're there and you can experience it. And a lot of my work and the work that, um, you know, I brought to the students was sort of in that vein, you know, it's sort of, it's a, it's sort of performative and it, and it happens in the moment and the, the light is projected, but then when you turn the lights off, there's nothing left, you know? So I love this idea of there being a really physical, tangible um, result from, from the uh, the project, and uh, so I, I I thought that's sort of an interesting sort of distinction. You know, with the digital, it's very ephemeral. It's maybe you know exists on the internet or um, you know as a recording, uh, but it, but it, it lacks some of that physical permanence that um, uh, you know and that that other other works can really um, showcase. So I don't know how that relates necessarily to the acequia, uh, but um, but I think it's just an interesting. You know, thing that um, is different between these mediums, and you know, I when I first started with, you know, film and media, it was you know, it was tangible, it was film, you know, and mm -hmm. I had the experience of actually cutting film and taping it together and constructing this sort of, you know, physical um, uh, sort sort of um, work, and so I, I'd love to see ways to you know bring some of these digital things back into the physical a bit and how to and how to make it have an impact or some kind of lasting impression. It's kind of like both of the, the new technology and the, well, what would I call it? Low technology, low, low tech, low tech, mm -hmm. old technology. In reality, they're both being able to work with them. You know, there's a sense of competency when you start spinning a, narr a narrative. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's the sharing part too. You know, that, that uh, it's not, it, it's, if there's a physical aspect to working with a, a hand tool, but whether it's ephemeral with the technology or whether it's something that's left with, you know, all these, you know, all these yards of rope left over, um, there is something about spinning narratives that, that uh, can be shared after the event. Um, you know, these students that worked with, with you, Morgan, uh, I'm sure they had some insights that they didn't expect, you know, just by doing that, doing that work. And um, again, you know, I'm, I just, to me, the, the most satisfying image, I just remember this father with two sons. I think they were around 10, 12 years old, but just really trying to show their, their prowess and their, you know, their, their physical strength and just determined to really make a good rope. And they did. Um, and I think they took it with them. I can't remember. It was, it was just, but that sense of watching that father and their two sons really working and, and, and the satisfaction that they got when they had the rope, 
but um, it, it, it is, I'm sure they, you know, they thought about it, they might have talked about it later as, you know, something that they did together, but um, there is something when you have a competency working with technology and you have a handle on it, it's empowering. It's empowering. And with the Asekia, uh, part of that too is there's, there's something that's very empowering when you have planted your seeds and you have these little furrows. And you know, even if it's a tiny little trickle of water, when you have that water trickling down for your seeds, that's empowerment too. Yeah, I uh, was. I, I thought the you bringing up the distinction, Morgan, of um, between having like a physical uh, artifact uh, um, that happens after after the piece is done, and then digital technology being a little bit more intangible is. Um, but I I also thought that the the object or the artifact that that remains after um, after immersive technology is often like people's experience. Um, with interacting with the work or people the I'm sure those who were interviewed by your students are also um, that exchange is kind of like sticks with people stays present with people and um, that's been something over the course of this whole Asekiaki discussion series um, that's been something that's has that's been a recurring theme that the the these rituals and the community gatherings and what people the, the exper lived experiences that people walk away with when they um, when they participate in the history of the Asekias or um, when they participate in maintaining them, uh, like the, that is what sort of solidifies um, a community communal use of of these ditches and uh, and another big another big theme that has come up is that the continuous use is essential to the survival of the ditch system and the survival of us as a people in this desert climate. <laughs> um, so I think that that's really interesting and cool. <laughs> um, I also wanted to, uh, let me just go back to some of my notes. Um, the, I wanted to, to talk about the dicho that accompanies water wisdom, Juanita, um, and it's in English, it's days of survival do not favor idle hands and minds, which I thought also uh, does not favor idle hands and um, that relates to this spinning and, and weaving together, but days of survival do not fa favor idle hands or and minds. And I think about, um, again, the engagement of the mind and, um, and this sort of like more intangible ephemeral uh, digital collection of, of immersive storytelling. Um, how do you think uh, that dicho applies to the experiences? And this is for a question for both of you. Um, how do you think that applies to the experiences that we're having now um, with this sort of arid climate, the dry, drying rivers, drying ditches? I, I kind of equate that with maybe some of the experiences during quarantine. I mean, I've heard a range of, of uh, reactions, you know, it's been a whole year. And uh, there are some people that were really not affected with being isolated. And there were some that had a hard time dealing with it. But I think that's also part of it because the people who were handling it, they had things to do, you know. Um, uh, for my yeah, part, you know, I could work with fiber, but, um, you know, I refined a chicken coop. <laughs> I found an old dresser that someone had donated and I converted that dresser into a chicken coop, uh, you know, using my tools um, and, and just different things during the, uh, the whole event where I was busy. I was busy and um, I was able to make things that I could give. Oh, masks. I made, mm -hmm. I made a hundred masks at least that uh, I kept seven, but the rest went to people who I thought could use them. Um, it's, it's idle hands and idle minds. Um, if you're confined at home day after day after day after day for a whole year, uh, that could get really, uh, it could get intense. But if you really have something that you can do, you can invent, you can troubleshoot, you can, uh, 
you can, you know, well, troubleshooting is, is part of it. You know, use what you have, use what's around you. Uh, and that was part of the survival in the, you know, in the, the, the early days here with the settlements. Um, but um, it really has to do with uh, perception, again, this perception of competency. And boy, that is so empowering. Mm -hmm. Even in the middle of a, of a pandemic, it, it's a very strong sense of empowerment. And it's also a very strong sense of empowerment when you're using the water from the acequia to make a garden to feed your family. And then, you know, when you go out there with your baskets and you start collecting the food to bring in for supper, boy, that is such a satisfying uh, empowerment. It really is empowering because it's empowering the body to continue with nourishment. I, I love that. I mean, it's so, it's just like, it's such a direct connection of you know water to to life you know and it's and it's a it's it's the aseki system you know it it's like very it's so intentional you know and it's so important to maintain and to develop and so like you know i i kind of think it, you know in times of you know drought we're hearing about all, all this kind of mega drought right now and you know how important it is to really manage water to support life to sustain life and so for me, it, it brings up a lot of things, especially here in New Mexico with the extractive, um, uh, you know, technologies and, and, you know, using water to extract natural gas and all that, that it's, it, there's so much use of water that is, um, you know, not that really direct connection to directly, su you know, supporting, sustaining life. And so it really calls out to me just the, the kind of contrast there of how water is used in New Mexico when we have these dwindling, dwindling resources that we need to protect and, and maintain, you know, to provide for, for the people. And um, thinking about uh, ensuring a sustainable future and um, amidst all of this, amidst the climate change and the climate crisis that we experience, um, I want to know what you think about um, the cultural and artistic intersections with ensuring a sustainable future as artists, as educators. Um, I want to hear from you about how, you know, there are a number of ways to ensure sustainability and ensure, um, ensure moisture in this climate. There are a number of ways to think about that from a, from a scientific engineering side, but what is there to do artistically or culturally to, um, to be more sustainable? Um, I, I can chime in a, a little bit on, on some ideas I have about that. I, I um, recently um, uh, heard an interview with this um, water, uh, an artist down in, um, in the South um, part of the, of, of the country. And it was, it was really interesting. He, he used rainwater exclusively for, for watercolor. And that's like something really simple, right? But it's like, it was really beautiful and, and intentional and almost magical, you know, this was painted only with rainwater. So it's, it's like looking at, at, you know, how, you know, as artists working with traditional mediums are, are using, you know, not, not wasting, you know, and, and being very intentional uh, about how, how you're using things. And then I love this idea that um, Juanita was talking about with using upcycling, right? Using other things to create something new, you know, and um, like, I, I think that that's something that will be, you know, I think more and more important to find ways to, to reuse things in, in creative ways. Um, this was years ago now in like the mid or 2000s. Um, I did a, a project that did this kind of upcycling with plastic bags. So we collected plastic bags and um, using uh, um, uh, not wax paper, but parchment paper and an iron, you can sort of heat fuse them into a more durable material. And we kind of stitched them together to make screens that we projected on. And the whole thing was about raising awareness about plastic bag use, you know? So I think, you know, trying to find interesting ways to, to, to reuse materials, I think is a really good, good idea. Uh, and then also, you know, doing work that really addresses the problems, you know, and builds community around finding some kind of solution.
to bring the cultural and the art quality into, into um, work, into a work environment. I think the first thing that can happen, especially with the narratives and the, and the connection with the past, maybe with the ancestors, or maybe the people that had lived here before, whether or not they're direct ancestors, but there's a thing about honoring resources and honoring the people who were there before, because we wouldn't be here <laughs> before the, I mean, everything that we have has to do with, you know, ancestral connections, whether it's blood and blood and bone, or just the, the ability to, um, to use a tool to sharpen a knife or to, make a tortilla on the, on the stove. <laughs> There's a thing about honoring resources. And the other part about it is creating uh, something beautiful. There's a, there's a aesthetics about it and bring getting pleasure out of that. It's bringing pleasure of, of accomplishment. Um, and, and there's something too about, you don't have to be real hardcore purist, cultural traditionalist because really the whole thing of honoring resources also has to do with uh, using your brain with what you have at hand, use what you got and, and figuring out a new way to create a solution for what you need. So, you know, there's that tradition of, 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 of a continuity, but um, it really is all about using what you have at the moment. And uh, so, there's a lot that can be guiding, but really in the moment, you, you have to use your brain, you have to figure it out, you have to problem solve. And I think a lot of, a lot of people are afraid to use the, create solutions because they really don't know how to use their hands with tools. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing. I remember the first time I went, to, uh, I went to Chicago, I was living in Chicago for a while, how many people had no idea how to use a screwdriver? I mean, it's, it's, you know, I was speechless. It, you know, here that would be like, que vergüenza. You know, that's that's <laughs> a shameful thing. You don't know how to use a screwdriver, <laughs> but a lot of people really don't. So it's it's, um, but it is. I think really having a sense of honoring the resources, honoring your ability, and honoring what lessons you have learned from the past. And I just wanted to, to follow up on that. And it, that just kind of takes me back to education, you know, and, and what are what our kids are doing? What's what are the priorities for them? I'm like, you know, I'm a father, I'm super uh, blessed that my son is in a school where he's learning how to crochet, you know, he's learning, he's been doing spinning, you know, he's been working with his hand, you know, it's just, I see that lacking in, in most education and it's all about testing and things like that. So it really is like, what, what are the values that are really important to, to sustain, maintain and, and grow? I know that whenever I have a presentation to make, um, you have your, your plan, plan A, and that probably will include technology, but someone said, well, what about plan, you know, what if everything fails? And someone said, well, plan F. No, 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 it's not plan F. It's uh, almost um, kind of like Neanderthal where you don't have electricity and you may not have very special tools, but if you look around, you do have some plan that you can incorporate. And, and the confidence to be able to problem solve, I think is really, really essential. Some people, um, don't know how to problem solve. They don't know where to start. And at least, you know, if you have a sense of competency, you can do it. You can, you can figure something out, even if it's only temporary, but you can always figure something out. And uh, I don't know, I, I work more with third grade than any other age. And uh, those third graders are pretty willing to try anything. And I think from, even from mistakes, you know, a mistake really is um, your attitude. You, you can make a mistake, but with the right attitude, it's actually a gift of experience. And I think that that also, um, that ties into this idea of upcycling and recycling materials and having the, um, 
just having skills and knowing what it's like to work with your hands, uh, knowing the, like being able to solve problems with your hands and, and, um, and sort of like engineer your way out of a situation by being able to know how to spin or how to, how to weave crochet, whatever like that, that sort of is the foundation for then understanding like, oh, I can use a plastic bag to make, I can use plastic bags to make a projector screen rather than purchase a whole new projector screen and, and sort of just like waste the resource almost. Um, this idea of the convenience and the quickness of just like purchasing something totally new is um, stems from, uh, I think stems from um, not feeling empowered enough to solve your own problems. And to and to just like think for a little for a little bit to to get to a solution. Also, I see a lot of um, uh, when people are isolated from one in, from one another. And this is even before the um, before the pandemic. There's there was such a sense of like cultural isolation where people are not necessarily um, gathered together or like they're not ready to solve a problem together with with each other. Um, and I think that that's something that's so special about a sequia culture is that you have to, um, all of the parciantes and um, landowners who have these ditches running through their property, there's, you know, it takes real community gathering. You have to gather every week to, um, to settle, settle disputes and, and talk to one another and maintain, maintain these irrigation ditches together. And so I think that there's also like this idea of community gathering and um, to me, what is special about both of your interventions at the Paseo Festival is that you instigated these moments of lots of people coming together and that uh, broke down a lot of barriers of, of cultural isolation. And I think it's yeah. just really special. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was gonna say that, that uh, you know, it was a great experience to, to invite people to come up and, and draw and, and have their work then, you know, projected out. And it was great just to see families and they're like, oh, an opportunity to draw. And, and, they, and, and they got engaged, you know, because, they, because people love, you know, especially young kids love to just draw things. So it, it prompted a lot of just great interactions that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have happened otherwise, you know, and, and just having that invitation to fill an empty page with your ideas, whether it's a scribble, or it's more elaborate, I think is um, a great way to get conversations going. People like it when they have hands-on experiences, especially with guidance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have people like, you know, there's somebody in charge of the, in, of the installation and uh, just to see everybody else getting involved and then, okay, I'll try it too. So that, I think that's good. I, I had so much fun last at that the paseo. I missed it this past year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, yeah. That's been the biggest. The biggest struggle is is definitely not being able to um, not being able to to gather around. And I was hearing from in our first conversation in this series with uh, Mark Henderson and Fritz Hahn. Mm -hmm. They were talking about the sort of how, how they adapted to, um, you know, when you have to like come together in a big group to dig out the, um, dig out sort of the, the debris and get the acequias ready for it to be opened this spring, they had to really adapt their, their methods to be able to have people safely together and, um, and come together to, to maintain the ditches. And um, it's certainly something that we won't be taking for granted. <laughs> and, uh, now that now that things are sort of returning to a safe level of gathering, um, we're just about at time. So I just want to say a few words to thank you both for your generous insights. Um, thank you for discussing the process of your work and um, talking about sort of after the fact what happened um, with your interventions. And also thank you for your insights about. Um, education. And um, I appreciate you both as educators. And uh, it's, it, that is also ensuring a sustainable future is um, really getting into the, into the minds of young people to have them engage. So I appreciate it so much.